Cool. All right. So welcome, everybody. Um, like I say, this is a in intensive care society webinar on central nervous system infections in intensive care. Um, I've got the great, great privilege today of having with today Simon Nadell, Nick Davis and David Menon, um, who are going to talk about um, the challenges and controversies of, of diagnosing CNS infections in critical care medicine. Um, this um, particular webinar is sponsored by an educational grant from Biomeria. Um, so the Intensive Care Society for many years has been um, committed to um, providing free open access um, educational material to, um, to practitioners throughout the world. And so thanks to Biomeria for helping us to continue with that. Um, if you have colleagues who've missed this and are sad that they've missed this, of course, um, this talk will be um, broadcast tomorrow on the um, Intensive Care Society's YouTube channel. So anyone who's sad that they've missed this talk, they can catch up again later there. Um, and so without further ado, I'll just hand over to our speakers um, to talk to us about their topics. If there are questions throughout, there is a web chat box at the bottom marked questions. If you please just write your questions in there as we're going along, we'll be delighted to answer them at the end. Okay. Hello, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. My name is Simon Nadell. I'm a consultant in paediatric intensive care at St. Mary's Hospital in London. I'm going to talk about the evaluation of non-traumatic coma in children. I'm going to start with a case presentation, which is that of a 15 month old girl who presented to us about three weeks ago. She'd been completely well and she suddenly developed afebrile seizures at home, which continued for about 50 minutes. In the ambulance, she was found to be febrile. She was given benzodiazepines in the ambulance and phenytoin in the emergency department, after which she stopped fitting, but she was intubated for respiratory depression. She was taken to the CT, where the CT scan was normal. When she came up to the PICU, we were gonna wake her up and extubate her, but she developed decorticate posturing and further seizures. So these were unresponsive to the normal treatment. So she started on a thiopentone infusion. She continued fitting during the night despite benzodiazepines and ketamine. And the next day she had a normal MRI scan. Eventually after two or three days, she stopped fitting and she was woken up. Uh, before she woke up completely, she had a normal lumbar puncture. When she woke up, she, her neurology was relatively normal surprisingly, and we don't really have a diagnosis. She was diagnosed speculatively with atypical febrile seizures. So I'm just going to talk about the causes of and management of non-traumatic coma in children. As you can see, the incidence is 30 per 100,000 children per year, roughly, which is very much less than the incidence of traumatic brain injury in children. It's useful to categorize the causes of non-traumatic coma in children into coma with focal signs, coma without focal signs or meningeal irritation, and coma without focal signs but with meningeal irritation. So coma with focal signs is usually due to intracranial hemorrhage or stroke, which are both rare in children. Brain tumours, which may present at any age. Focal infections, such as brain abscess or tuberculoma. Todd's paralysis after seizure, which again is very rare, I've never seen it. And other unusual conditions, such as acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or ADEM. Coma without focal signs and without meningeal irritation is usually in children due to hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, such as occurs after a cardiac arrest. Uh, but it's also really important to keep in mind conditions in young infants or young children or older children, which can include the metabolic disorders, which may be inborn errors of metabolism, diabetic ketoacidosis or hypoglycemia, hyperaminemia and other uh, rare conditions. Fluid and electrolyte disturbances occur commonly in young children. Severe dehydration with hyponatremia or hypernatremia can cause coma. Systemic infections such as uh, 
bacterial sepsis, systemic sepsis, meningoencephalitis can occur without meningeal irritation. Um, encephalopathy can uh, be a presenting feature of toxic shock syndrome and conditions such as uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome can present with encephalopathy and coma. Clearly convulsive or non-convulsive status epilepticus. Post-infectious disorders such as acute necrotizing encephalopathy or acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. It's really important to think of drugs and toxins in children, particularly young children can uh, have accidental uh, intoxication. Other infections depending on epidemiology may include cerebral malaria and other rarer infections. Hypertensive encephalopathy can occur in children. It's rare, but it can still occur. And post-seizure post states may cause coma because clearly not all seizures in children are recognized. Coma without focal signs but with meningeal irritation is usually due to meningitis or encephalitis and rarely in children subarachnoid hemorrhage. So the mainstay of evaluation and treatment is really to prevent secondary brain injury and herniation. And the signs of intracranial hypertension uh, in the early phases are reduced or fluctuating level of consciousness. Remember, young infants can still develop intracranial hypertension even if they have open sutures and an open fontanelle, and these may present with an abnormal level of consciousness and a bulging fontanelle. And vomiting and seizures may occur uh, as a presenting sign of early intracranial hypertension. Later signs include uh, Cushing's triad, which include hypertension, bradycardia, and an abnormal respiratory pattern. Abnormal posturing. Papilledema is often looked for, but it's important to remember that in acutely raised intracranial pressure, papilledema may not be present. And other signs of brainstem dysfunction may clearly be present. Primary assessment and emergency management of the child in coma uh, are probably very similar between ch children and adults, but the uh, obvious things are to evaluate airway, breathing and circulation and recognize and treat intracranial pressure if, if it's raised. Treat hypoglycemia if it's present. If the Glasgow Coma Score is less than 8, then uh, the patient should be intubated with rapid sequence induction. Uh, if the, also, if there is shock present in the presence of coma or any evidence of herniation. If shock is present, then it's really important to try to maintain cerebral perfusion. So management of shock is really important. If the blood pressure is high, it could be both due to the, it could be the cause of the coma, such as in hypertensive encephalopathy, or the effect of the coma, such as is seen in Cushing's triad. And any hypertension should be treated with caution. If seizures are present or may be continuing, then treat them, obviously. Antimicrobials are really important to be given early, so broad-spectrum antibiotics and antivirals to treat herpes simplex encephalopathy, encephalitis. If signs of raised intracranial pressure are present or there is impending herniation, then urgent treatment with osmotherapy and more aggressive hyperventilation may be required. And obviously, once all these things have been sorted out, taking baseline investigation, including blood gases, a broad spectrum of blood, such as blood count and electrolytes, liver enzymes, and blood cultures, etc. So first line investigations also include lumbar puncture, but there are clearly uh, several contraindications to lumbar puncture, including clinical or radiological signs of raised intracranial pressure, the presence of shock or respiratory insufficiency, uh, the ongoing, ongoing convulsions, coagulopathy, thrombocytopenia, anticoagulant therapy or infection at the site of the lumbar puncture. But lumbar puncture should be performed as soon as possible once contraindications are no longer present because it could still produce important results even if performed days later. CT scan of the brain is clearly important where no causes are known or where there's focal neurological abnormality 
or signs of raised intracranial pressure, but it's important to remember that CT scanning is not sensitive for the presence of raised intracranial pressure. So you may have a normal CT, but signs of raised ICP. And remember, a CT should only be done after stabilization of the child and recognizing the risk of transporting a critically ill patient to the scanner. Second line investigations include EEG, serial EEGs are more useful so you can spot any trends. MRI should be done now as soon as possible in any patient with unexplained coma, uh, which is much more sensitive than CT and can direct therapy if there are signs on the MRI of viral or autoimmune encephalitis or ADA. And in children who present with unexplained coma, broad metabolic testing, including ammonia, amino acids, organic acids, and various other investigations. Uh, the mainstay of therapy in patients with raised intracranial pressure is neuroprotection, and the uh, modalities of neuroprotection include all the following on this slide, positioning, temperature control, maintenance of glucose and electrolyte homeostasis, adequate oxygenation, CO2 being maintained in a strict range, blood pressure monitoring. There's no evidence that intracranial pressure monitoring is, is beneficial in children with non-traumatic coma. Fluid and, uh, fluid, strict fluid management and osmotic therapy may be important together with adequate sedation, possibly neuromuscular blockade, anticonvulsant therapy and surgical options are, are rarely uh, pursued unless there's acute hydrocephalus. Just this slide is to demonstrate the uh, rarity these days in the conjugate vaccine era of finding uh, bacterial meningitis as a cause of uh, meningitis. So in this series of patients who had meningitis sorry, who had lumbar punctures for suspected meningitis. Only 13 out of a total of 70 who had meningitis were found to have bacterial pathogens. The rest were mainly viral or unknown. Much more common nowadays and being increasingly recognized is the, uh, is the diagnosis of autoimmune encephalopathy. So this slide is really to demonstrate the different kinds of uh, autoantibodies and diseases associated with usually post-infectious uh, presentations and various autoantibodies are being discovered uh, frequently as a cause of autoimmune encephalopathy. So in conclusion, uh, it's important to recognize, evaluate and treat uh, encephalopathy and coma in children aggressively. Unfortunately, Outcomes, depending on the cause, may be poor, uh, but surprisingly, some outcomes, even in children who may present with very severe coma and signs of raised intracranial pressure, as in our patient, she actually had a good outcome. So the outcome is really dependent on the cause of the coma and the cause of the encephalopathy. So I'm sure there'll be a um, chance to ask questions later. Thank you for listening and I'll pass on to the next speaker, Dr. Nicholas Davies. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you this evening. My name is Nicholas Davies. I'm a consultant neurologist at Chelsea and Westminster and Charing Cross Hospitals in London. Uh, my area of subspecialty expertise is neurological infection. This evening's topic is broad and only a little can be covered within 10 minutes. I intend to use uh, acute viral encephalitis as um, the condition uh, that we'll talk about most, but a lot that relates to it is also relevant to other CNS infections such as acute meningitis. As a physician, um, I know most about diagnostics and treatment, and this is where um, I will focus. I will not cover anything relating to the management of raised intracranial pressure or the management of a critically ill patient in ICU, as there are many other people in this um, audience and your society who could speak about this uh, with much more knowledge than myself. This slide shows the progression of brain changes in herpes simplex encephalitis over 72 hours. 
The reason for showing it is to make the point that our aim in management of CNS infections is to avoid uh, a CT head scan looking like the center or that to the right of your screens. We want to identify infections early and minimize acquired brain injury for optimum outcome. In the case shown with these CT head scan images, uh, the diagnosis of herpes simplex encephalitis was unfortunately delayed. Obtaining a good history is key to making um, an early diagnosis of a CNS infection. This is often very difficult in an obtunded patient. The cardinal symptoms and signs of encephalitis are fever, alteration in level of consciousness and seizures. The incidence of encephalitis is highest at the extremes of age. On examining the patient, the presence of focal or lateralizing neurology can be very helpful, not only for gauging raised intracranial pressure, but also for understanding potential viral etiologies, as many viruses have specific tropisms to different parts of the brain or central nervous system. There are sporadic and epidemic causes. It's important to ascertain um, patients' exposure to animals and vectors in particular, uh, such as um, mosquitoes, and often that comes through a detailed travel history. It's also very important in any patient presenting with a suspected CNS infection to ascertain their potential um, immunocompetence or suppression. All patients uh, presenting with a CNS infection warrant an HIV test. Worldwide, there are a huge number of causes of viral encephalitis, but here in the UK, the commonest causes are HSV type 1, varicella zoster virus, and particularly in children, enteroviruses. If a patient is immunosuppressed, then uh, many other viruses come into play here in the UK, and in particular, uh, lymphotropic herpes viruses such as CMV, HHV6, etc. Imaging is a particularly useful modality uh, for determining anatomy and pathological processes in patients with suspected CNS infections. Whereas CT head scans are often unremarkable at the time of presentation, particularly with herpes simplex encephalitis, uh, usually MRI changes uh, become apparent very quickly. The images shown here are from a patient who was scanned through a stroke pathway using MRI who had hyperacute symptoms suggestive of herpes simplex encephalitis. She had, had, um, a uh, she had woken up with a fever a few hours uh, before presenting to hospital and had had a seizure uh, outside the hospital. This MRI scan is within 45 minutes of presentation and even here you can see changes uh, already in the right temporal lobe. It is very unusual um, for a patient with herpes simplex encephalitis to have a normal MRI head scan um, after 72 hours from symptom onset. CSF examination where safe is key for establishing uh, etiology in cases of suspected CNS infection. There are potential pitfalls. Where CSF is sampled hyperacutely, um, there may be normal cell findings. This can even occur in acute meningitis. A similar phenomenon is seen with viral brain infections using PCR. The chance of detecting HSV DNA by PCR in CSF is highest in CSF obtained um, 24 to 72 hours after symptom onset as opposed to hyperacutely. Repeat lumbar punctures are sometimes required in the presence of negative findings. CNS infections are not always easy um, to identify. There are many other infectious or non-infectious etiologies that can um, be mimics. The imaging in front of you now is from a patient uh, whose etiology of their acute encephalitis was neurosyphilis. Other mimics of herpes simplex and virus um, encephalitis include varicella zoster, HHV6 in the immunocompromised, enterovirus, West Nile virus, and even TB.
non-infectious etiologies can also mimic acute encephalitis. The images shown at you here um, are from a patient with PRES, that is the posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. He had had a flu-like illness uh, a week before presentation, but at the time of presentation did have labile blood pressure. Other non-infectious um, mimics of herpes simplex encephalitis to consider are neoplastic lesions such as glioma, cerebral vasculitis, autoimmune limbic encephalitis, and uh, unilateral pres. Treatment of herpes simplex encephalitis in adults is with high-dose intravenous acyclovir at a dose of 10 milligrams per kilograms intravenously thrice daily, presuming the patient has normal renal function. Although most acyclovir elimination is through renal excretion, some is uh, liver metabolized. One liver metabolite, carboxymethoxymethylguanine, uh, at high levels can cause encephalopathy. It is this metabolite that is responsible for encephalopathy caused by acyclovir in patients with renal dysfunction. The duration of treatment with acyclovir in cases of proven herpes simplex encephalitis is not widely agreed, but most authorities suggest two to three weeks of treatment. In the UK, guidance suggests repeat lumbar puncture to ensure that the CSF is clear of HSV DNA before halting acyclovir. Relapse of, her of herpes simplex encephalitis is very rare in adults, but more widely recognized in children. Two types of relapse are recognized. One, very rare, is recrudescence of the viral infection itself. Increasingly recognized amongst children is the development of an autoimmune encephalitis following proven herpes encephalitis. This most frequently is the autoimmune encephalitis associated with antibodies against the NMDA receptor. In adults, autoimmune encephalitis is more often a mimic than a sequela of infectious encephalitis. Pointers to an autoimmune etiology include a subacute or progressive course, initial prominent psychiatric symptoms, the presence of an unusual movement disorder, seizures resistant to anti-convulsant medications, comparative lack of changes on MRI and in CSF, lack of fever at presentation, and the presence of hyponatremia early in the disease course. This is a list of current uh, cell surface antigens uh, associated with autoimmune encephalitis. The list grows year by year. Here are some useful resources uh, for management of patients with CNS infections, including adult guidelines, the National Imported Fever Service and the Encephalitis Society, who can provide uh, support to next of kin to your ICU patients. So in conclusion, uh, infection can cause CNS dysfunction in a variety of ways, both direct and indirect. For acute CNS infections, diagnostic pickup is improved by appropriate timing of investigations. Encephalitis of all causes uh, is associated with high rates of mortality and acquired brain injuries amongst survivors. Early diagnosis and treatment improves outcome. It remains me only to introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor David Menon, who will be talking about the exciting area of uh, neurological presentations in COVID. Thank you for asking me to speak about neuro-COVID. These are the themes that I will cover. I will talk a little bit about the epidemiology and clinical presentation. Very briefly mention the mechanisms and pathophysiology provide some indication of the chronic sequelae, and then touch on some caveats and cautions about associating various neurological conditions with the uh, disease itself. As regards epidemiology, there have been a, a range of initiatives across the globe to try and understand the incidence and the type of neurological sequelae that happen in patients who have COVID-19 these are three examples of that. The GCS NeuroCOVID study in the US, 
the Coronav study in the UK, and the European Academy of Neurology Energy Registry. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Coronav Registry because it covers what's happening in the UK. It's being led by Benedict Michael from Liverpool, and now is over 100 cases of patients who are reported primarily by neurologists, slightly less so by psychiatrists, and then also by intensivists and other specialties. This paper in Lancet Neurology is where we reported the first 153 patients. This was a rapid report over a three-week period of data collection. 28 of these were excluded, but of the 125 patients, we found that 77 had had a cerebrovascular event, 39 had altered mental status, six had peripheral uh, neurological disorders, perhaps game barrier or uh, uh, modern neuropathy, and three with other assorted neurological disorders. It's interesting to look at the age distribution, particularly of these two large categories. You can see that the cerebrovascular events were present in both age groups, but much more common in the older age groups going on up to uh, over 90, whereas the neuropsychiatric and encephalopathic presentations were commoner in the younger age group. This is not to say that the younger patients did not have stroke. These incidents, this, this incidence of stroke in, in younger patients aged 21 to 30, 31 to 40, and 41 to 50 is very surprising and talks to the prothrombotic state that's associated with the disease. More recently, individual centers have started bringing out their own descriptions and classifications with more detail. So this from Queen Square, uh, shows a report on 43 patients, 29 of whom were PCR positive, and 14 of whom had less certain diagnoses of COVID-19. They divided them up into encephalopathy, CNS inflammation, ischemic stroke, peripheral nervous system disorders, and miscellaneous, rather like with the corona epidemiological study. The encephalopathies consisted of patients who had either delirium with CSF and MRI being nonspecific, these patients were treated with supportive care and generally their outcome was good. There was a group who actually had evidence of encephalitis or inflammation either clinically or by the presence of acute disseminated encephalomyelitis on MRI or necrotizing encephalitis or, or spinal cord inflammation. These patients were treated with supportive care, often treated with steroids, and they had intermediate outcomes, some of them still were in hospital, and some had residual deficits. The ischemic strokes uh, were often associated in a subset with pulmonary embolism, which speaks to the fact that these patients may have had a prothrombotic state. The treatment was appropriate and varied, and the outcome was also varied depending on the size of the stroke. It's worth recording that in other large registries around the world, the uh, conventional treatment of stroke has been hampered by the fact that these patients have COVID, but there's an increasing push to ensure that these patients don't fail to benefit from interventions such as uh, thrombectomy. The patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, and brachial plexopathy either had an autoimmune disorder. These may have been because of stretch or pressure, but I'll say, say a bit more about this later. These were treated appropriately with GBS, being treated with IVIG, and other large registries suggest that if treated aggressively, many of these patients will make as good a recovery as patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome from other causes. And indeed, in, in this cohort, they often showed slow improvement. It's worth talking about two of these groups, the ischemic stroke group and the peripheral nervous system group in a little more detail because these are concrete conditions that we understand. And I think that probably the best paper for the stroke uh, work comes from New York, where this is uh, published recently. And what they did was, it was to compare the incidence of stroke in patients who were presenting with COVID, just under 2,000 patients, and with influenza, just under 1,500 patients. The age was not widely different. There was slightly higher male preponderance in the uh, patients with COVID, but you can see that the incidence of stroke was much higher in the COVID patients compared to the influenza patients in slightly different time epochs. When they looked at what were the uh, risk factors for patients with COVID-19 infection versus 
those with influenza infection, both adjusted and unadjusted, the risks were almost eightfold for the patients with COVID. And this uh, held in a variety of, of sensitivity analyses. It's interesting to see when these strokes happen. These are the, uh, the, the uh, 64 strokes, uh, uh, some proportion of the 64 strokes in, in terms of the time to onset of the ischemic stroke. And you can see that some of these patients presented with their ischemic stroke and were found to be COVID positive, whereas other patients had the ischemic stroke during the course of the illness, while some of them were well beyond four weeks and had the stroke quite late into the illness. It isn't clear how the severity of COVID parcelates within this, but clearly there must be multiple pathophysiological processes happening here. And the treatment for one of these groups, the acute presenting uh, patients, may be quite different from those who have stroke late in the course of their ICU stay. When it comes to peripheral nerve uh, injuries in um, critical illness in general, we know that traction and pressure can cause peripheral neuropathies, brachial plexus here, and ulnar neuropathy here. And also you can get critical illness, polyneuropathy, which is a distal symmetrical neuropathy. However, we recently published in the Journal of Neurology the fact that you could have a mononeuritis multiplex, which didn't actually fit with either of these pictures and had distribution both in the upper and the lower limb, which may have been driven either by reduced blood supply by involvement of the vasa nervorum, microhemorrhage in nerves, inflammation in the nerves, or possibly an autoimmune neuro neuropathy. The jury on mechanism is still out, but I think it's important for us as clinicians to recognize that this kind of a mononeuritis multiplex is an additional syndrome, other than or distinct from what we see with traction or pressure or with critical illness polyneuropathy. What about imaging? Um, there are a whole host of imaging papers. I've just chosen this one because it's relatively recent and covers a, a large number of patients and also has citations of the previous papers in it, so those who are interested can go there. There are both intracranial hemorrhages and infarction reported, and also leukoencephalopathy, as you can see here in the MR. And often there are multiple abnormalities with infarction and hemorrhage, and the hemorrhage can be subarachnoid intraparenchymal or mu multiple microhemorrhages, which are seen in, in some patients. If we try and correlate this with uh, neuropathology, we find uh, some good parallels. There are several neuropathology papers, but I think this is probably the best neuropathology paper from Berlin, 43 patients here who had fresh territorial ischemic lesions in six, widespread astrogliosis, inflammatory changes with microglia and cytotoxic T lymphocytes, most pronounced in the brainstem and cerebellum, worth noting, and I'll be talking about this a bit more, and also meningeal cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Critically, they detected SARS-CoV-2 by immunohistochemistry in lower cranial nerves and in isolated cells in the brainstem. But they make the point that whether they detected SARS-CoV-2 or not was unassociated with the severity of neuropathological changes. So the question then is, is most of this because of a viral infection or is this mostly because of a host response? So we've tried to answer that in a pair of papers that we published recently from Cambridge looking at uh, both MRI and neuropathology in, in small sets of patients. As far as the MR is concerned, we selected areas and in, in brains and patients where the MR seemed to be normal and showed that the quantitative MRI was widely abnormal. And this varied with brain region. So what we did was to undertake diffusion tensor imaging and measure the mean diffusivity of the tissue in these areas. And you can see that the differences between controls and COVID patients are clearly different. All of these areas showed significant differences across the six patients. But what is interesting is that the direction of difference was reversed. In the case of the brainstem, what we found was the mean diffusivity of water in the brain was restricted, whereas in the supratentorial compartment, there was an increase in mean diffusivity. What does that mean? Well, a reduction in mean diffusivity has been associated with inflammation or swelling of brain cells, whereas an increase in mean diffusivity is associated with vasogenic edema, essentially leaky blood vessels. 
And when we undertook the neuropathological examination in two patients, what we found was that the supratentorial compartment often showed areas of infarction. You can see the microthrombus here within the vessel with infarction around it, and often basogenic edema. Whereas in the brainstem, we often saw lymphocytic infiltration, which was more in keeping with inflammation rather than uh, the basogenic edema we saw. So this shows that you can have very similar clinical presentations. These were all patients who failed to wake up rapidly after we had stopped sedation, but can have widely differing mechanisms and pathophysiologies that are responsible. So, so much for the, um, for the uh, clinical presentations, imaging, and pathological features. How can we tie them all together in terms of what happens with the pathophysiology? So there are many papers on pathophysiology, but this one I think is a useful uh, clinically translatable paper. And what the point it makes is that SARS-CoV-2 infection can cause central nervous system insult either by the systemic host response, multiple organ failure, coagulopathy, or inflammation, by direct CNS invasion and cell death or dysfunction. There have been occasional case reports of viral encephalitis, meningitis, and endothelitis, but this is uncommon. Peripheral or muscle involvement, which may be a direct viral neuropathy or host response, and a post-infectious immune-mediated Guillain-Barre syndrome or white matter uh, or necrotizing encephalopathy. So much for the mechanisms, but it's important to recognize that these mechanisms don't just apply to the acute phase, they also apply to the chronic phase. And what you have is a mixture of physiological compromise cytokine storm and autoimmunity, prolonged critical care, and psychological stresses of the whole COVID process. And this results in a whole spectrum of symptoms, which we have uh, often recognized in patients who are recovering from critical illness. But here in this context has been described as the COVID-19 long haul syndrome. It looks very much like the consequences of severe, severe critical illness, except that many of these patients may not have been critically ill. This is being investigated in a range of studies with both structural and functional MRI, neurocognitive and mental health assessments, cardiorespiratory assessments, immune function and autoantibodies, and assessment of the airway and respiratory function. Finally, I'd just like to sound a cautionary note. All the descriptions I've provided with you are of associations with very little evidence as yet of causal links. Our understanding of pathophysiology suggests that some of these associations will be truly causal, but till we have more proof, we just need to be careful. And those of you who are interested, I would direct to this paper from uh, Ben Michael and his colleagues, which uh, was done as part of the corona uh, study. I'd just like to finish by acknowledging all of my colleagues in Cambridge who have contributed to the NeuroCOVID team. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Enormous thanks to um, Simon and Nick and David for taking the time to sort of present these to us. And um, we do have a few questions. Um, Simon and Nick, if you could just turn your microphones on and your cameras on so we can see, that'd be great. Uh, I'm going to go through them in time order if that's agreeable with you. There's a few related to diagnosis and a few related to treatments. Yeah. Okay. So the first question is from Steve Lord. Thank you very much for asking your question. It reads, um, with regards to the timing of lumbar puncture, do you actively wait 24 hours in a hyperacute presentations of HSV encephalitis to improve diagnostic yield, or do you just repeat the LP after 24 hours if you're very suspicious still? No, I wouldn't delay an LP. Um, I, I'd get on and do it because you need to look for differentials, other things going on. But I think where you have an unexpected negative result, um, then I think it's important to um, repeat it and not to stop uh, uh, treatment. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Anyone else got anything to add in on that or not a present? Okay. Um, so the next question from Rebecca Dooley. Again, thank you. Um, and apologies that your question seems to disappear. That's probably my fault. Um, it's about, um, it's a question about the increased sensitivity of LP for virus at 40 hours. And it asks whether that increased sensitivity is still there, regardless of whether you give therapy or not, or is it only untreated? Um, and are there any clinical features that we can use to guide in which cases we should do a repeat LP at 48 hours? So, um, uh, so 
um, PCR detects um, um, uh, nucleic acid, and so it doesn't matter whether the organism's dead or alive. In terms of um, viral infections, it makes little difference. And uh, certainly with HSV encephalitis, um, usually you can still detect the virus um, uh, five days, sometimes a week or more um, after uh, treatment started. So I never worry about um, um, acyclovir and detecting uh, HSV DNA. Uh, the second part of the question was... Um, so it, what, what clinical features would you use to essentially guide whether you would do a PCRP at 48 hours if you got perhaps a negative first tap? So I think, um, uh, you know, really, you, have you got an alternative diagnosis? Uh, and um, I think the most important thing, as perhaps uh, we saw from Simon's talk, is that you've got to continue the diagnostic process. In adult medicine, um, sometimes we find that... Um, patients are given a putative diagnosis of HSV encephalitis, put on acyclovir, and the diagnostic process grinds to a halt. And that also is um, a problem because other treatable causes for encephalopathy are missed. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, uh, sorry, Simon. Yeah, just to add, um, even in bacterial meningitis, uh, delayed LP is not so much of a problem anymore because of molecular diagnostics. So you could still have a positive uh, PCR for meningococcus or pneumococcus 24, 48 hours into the illness despite effective antimicrobial treatment. So it's, as I said in my talk, it's still worth doing lumbar puncture, even if it's delayed when it's safe to do so. Thanks. Fantastic, thank you for that. So our next question comes from Jacob Burr. Thank you for asking your question, um, which reads, in patients who are obtunded on presentation um, and therefore the ability to clinically differentiate between bacterial meningitis or viral encephalitis is difficult or impossible, um, is there any role for early steroid administration and is there any evidence for harm if you give steroids to an encephalitis patient early in the disease? Uh, so from the adult perspective, um, there is evidence that um, steroids can be helpful for a short period in um, particularly pneumococcal meningitis. Um, so uh, I, I would have no qualms with um, steroids being given if um, uh, meningitis, uh, acute pyogenic meningitis enter the differential. In terms of whether um, steroids are helpful uh, for um, viral encephalitis and particularly HSV encephalitis, well, that's something subject to a, a trial at the moment. And there are many reasons to believe from animal models that steroids may be beneficial in the management of HSV encephalitis, but we don't have an answer yet. Uh, and I, I wouldn't routinely recommend giving steroids at this stage for proven HSV encephalitis. Fantastic, thanks, that's very useful. Um, the next question is from an anonymous, uh, an anonymous sorry, um, attendee um, who asks um, whether PCR should be favoured for diagnosis of encephalitis. Um, they don't say over what, but imagine over viral culture. So viral culture, I think, has been largely abandoned. Um, I, I don't know of any centre that will still do it routinely. Yes, PCR um, is a much better test, but obviously um, you have to know what you're looking for. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you. OK, so the next question has moved on to um, uh, COVID-19. Um, and it's again from an anonymous attendee who asked whether the severity of COVID is associated with the development of neuropsychiatric symptoms. And I think the question is also related to whether your data um, only relates to hospitalised patients or to the general population. I'll also answer the first question. Um, some, some of the neurological sequelae are unrelated. So stroke can occur in people who have relatively mild um, COVID-19 by respiratory symptoms. The encephalopathic presentations, the, which, which we see in other intensive care patients, I think are commoner the sicker you are. Uh, in terms of acute psychotic episodes and um, acute depressive episodes, those can happen. Catatonia has been described. There are now two cases being investigated, one in this country, I think, and one that's been written up in South America. I don't know about this country, maybe both of them are outside where there's a defense of having had acute COVID for a murder or an attempted murder. So it can cause acute mania. Um, so that's it in terms of the severity. In terms of, is this only for hospitalized patients? Uh, so all of the data that I've presented is for hospitalized patients, but I, I'd be very surprised uh, 
if there isn't uh, some evidence of neurological involvement in non-hospitalized patients, there's been a paper out just today where they've looked at brain injury biomarkers in mild to moderate COVID. Not strictly sort of staying at home, not um, having to come into hospital, but I suspect if you did that, you might still find some evidence of subtle neurological injury. Great, thank you so much. So the next question is essentially going back to so looking at blood pressure targets um, in those with elevated ICP um, and asks, as again an anonymous attendee, how can you differentiate between hypertension as a cause or a consequence of raised ICP? Is the question. I could start, but I'm sure my adult colleagues will <laughs> either correct me or stop me. Um, I suppose if you're treating the raised ICP by whatever mode of therapy, hyperventilation, osmotherapy, whatever, and the blood pressure comes down and the heart rate goes up, then you can assume, I suppose, that the hypertension is a consequence of the raised ICP. If your treatment doesn't affect the blood pressure or the blood pressure goes up further, or there are other signs of uh, chronic hypertension, such as, you know, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy or um, signs of hypertensive retinopathy, then I think you could assume that the hypertension is the cause of the encephalopathy, but I'm, I would stand to be corrected. Um, so in, in, in the neurointensive care unit, when patients pitch up, uh, they usually have both. <laughs> They've had a hypertensive bleed. What, what you do see is patients who've had subarachnoid hemorrhage who have hydrocephalus. And again, uh, you tend to have both. It, it doesn't matter because generally in that situation, you want to control the blood pressure, but you want to control intracranial pressure as well. Uh, and the diagnosis in many situations in intensive care comes second to making sure that the acute uh, situation is dealt with. So treat uh, symptomatically while trying to make a diagnosis. Fantastic. Thank you so much, both of you, for that. Um, the next question, again, from an anonymous attendee, um, asks about the use of, um, if there is any data on the use of antiplatelets and or um, low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis in patients with a stroke in the context of COVID-19. So there's no evidence as yet to show that it's useful for prophylaxis. Uh, once patients have had a stroke, I think they need to be dealt with uh, as you would deal with the stroke, unless they have another indication. The, I suppose the worst situation is where you have a big ischemic stroke with the risk of hemorrhagic conversion, and at the same time, the patient's thrown off a large embolus. I think you're between a rock and a hard place, and you just have to decide which part of the physiology is worst, and whether you can get away with an IBC filter. But many of those patients, particularly if they have a big embolus, you wind up giving them anticoagulants and then get some pads on your knees so you can kneel and pray at the same time. Uh, antiplatelets, um, uh, no, no evidence as yet. There is uh, a paper now looking more generally at preventing uh, thromboembolic co complications with aspirin, uh, but it's early data as yet. We wouldn't say that you should use it to prevent stroke um, unless there was a clear pre-existing risk factor. Brilliant, thank you so much for that. Um, our next question comes from Apuki, I'm sorry, I think I'm saying that right, um, who's asking about um, sort of the COVID long haul syndrome and whether it's different from post ICU syndrome. Um, and is this seen in non ICU COVID patients as well as the ICU population? Yeah, so I, I think um, it's, it's a spectrum. And uh, when I talk to my neurology colleagues who, are, who do functional uh, neurological disease, they have a tendency to say that a lot of the long haul COVID patients are likely to be FNDs, uh, functional neurological disease. I have to say that as far as I'm concerned, the jury's still out on that. It's entirely possible that it may be because of a relatively mild infection, but a dysregulated host immune response, either generally they've got the wrong mix of cytokines or because there's a central nervous system propensity to be responsive to relatively um, normal is the wrong word, but average levels of cytokines. So uh, the, 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 there's a spectrum, but certainly when we do our follow-up clinic uh, for COVID, it's a different kind of presentation. It looks like a slightly different disease. Uh, there are going to be big studies, both for the neurological consequences of severe and hospitalized uh, illness with COVID. And now there's been a, a call just two days ago for a large long, uh, long haul COVID study, which I think will happen soon. Brilliant, thank you so much. 
And our last question from Peter Bothmer, um, thank you for your question, um, goes back to talking about HSV and cephalitis. Um, and he asks, is there any place for immunoglobulin in treatment of HSV and cephalitis? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so, not yet. Um, I think there were some paediatric trials looking at um, giving IVIG to all patients presenting with uh, encephalitis. So I don't know if Simon has anything more to say than uh, my side on, uh, on the adult front. The, um, there was a study that was, um, that was uh, looking at randomizing children with encephalitis to IVIG or steroids, I think, I'm just trying to remember, but it was stopped early because of lack of recruitment. And I don't think there's been any data that have um, been released from the patients that were, were included, but there weren't that many included. So unfortunately that study still needs to be done. But I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any evidence that IVIG is beneficial in, in any form of encephalitis apart, I think, from there's some evidence that uh, patients with um, chronic enterovirus meningitis who are immunocompromised may benefit from IVIG supplementation or replacement. I think that's right, isn't it? And on the adult side, that's certainly the only situation um, I I've seen it used for infectious encephalitis. And in adult medicine, it's usually patients who've had um, too much rituximab um, and um, they've ended up with a chronic enterovirus infection. Brilliant, thank you so much. That's a really comprehensive answer, guys, thank you. Um, so we do have a few more minutes, people who are listening in. Um, if you do want to ask any questions, um, any final burning questions. Um, in the meantime, I'm just going to take the opportunity to, right to ask about a question for myself. It's probably mostly directed at Simon. It's regarded blood pressure targets in children with elevated ICP. What's your usual aim in terms of blood pressure for children? <laughs> that's a really terrible question. Um, it's all that's guess as difficult because I'm a horrible person. <laughs> it's guesswork, I'm afraid. Um, I don't know if I mentioned in my talk, there's no evidence that intracranial pressure monitoring and measuring cerebral perfusion pressure alters the outcome of non-traumatic coma in children. I'm not sure if there's any evidence in adults, but, but if we are aiming for neuroprotection, we would normally aim at... Um, 20 centimeters, 20 millimeters of mercury above the uh, age adjusted mean blood pressure, you know, to account for increases in intracranial pressure. So, assuming ICP is 20, then um, yeah, 20 above the mean, that's what we would do for. Which isn't a very accurate, you know, it's not a very good answer, but it's a kind of rough guess. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. And sorry for asking such a horrible question. Fab well, we don't seem to have any more questions from um, uh, our, our viewers. So um, it just remains for me to say an enormous thank you to Simon, Nick and David for spending your time with us to come and um, talk to us about the CNS infections in, in intensive care um, and answer our questions. Um, if you do have any colleagues who are um, disappointed they've not managed to be with us this evening, like I say, this talk will be um, broadcast tomorrow on the ICS YouTube channel. Um, so it'll be there for prosperity for anyone who wants to listen in again. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.